last time, which was looking at a high-low game. And we will, if I'm not mistaken, we left off looking at the um, the click event. We hadn't quite gotten to the click event yet. We had looked at everything up to that point, but not including the click event. So let me open it up, and we'll see how this how this works. And let me run it just to refresh our memory. Okay, we pick a choice of low, seven, or high. We then roll the dice, and if we roll a eight through 12, we win if we picked high. We roll a seven, and we pick seven, we win. We pick low, and it's two through six, we also win. The payout is one for a lower high, and four for a seven. I talked about this in my 243 class. Are any of you in that one today? The odds of winning if you pick seven are actually uh, six out of 36, which is one out of six, and they're paying four out of one. So you can tell that the odds are stacked against you. They pay one to one, so uh, and the odds are. Um, 15 out of 36 for either low or high. So they're, you know, the odds are working against you. The only reason I say that is in testing a game like this, it's good to have an idea about how often things come up. A seven should come up approximately one out of six times. So that would be something to test um, and so on. And uh, approximately two and a half out of six times or five out of 12 times, it should either be a low or, uh, uh, it would be a low, five out of 12, it would be a high, all right? Um, then two out of 12 should be, so run 12 tests and see what it is. Uh, run 24 tests maybe. The more that you do, the better uh, it'll come closest, closer to the expected values. Anyhow. We have a button in this case. We can pick what we want. Let's pick a seven. Let's gamble. And play. Ah, we lost. Lost. Lost again. I think we, yeah, we did win one in there. If it never rolled seven, we should be disturbed. Okay, there we rolled. We, we got a seven. All right, so the action happens on the on-click uh, method. And in our case, we did the same thing as we did in previous examples. Our activity extends activity, app compat activity, and implements an on-click listener. That is an interface that we're implementing. The interface only has one method, on-click. We've, uh, by, by saying that we have implemented that, that um, uh, interface, we are promising that this class will have an on-click event that looks like this. On-click that accepts as an argument a view. All right? If it didn't have that, we would get an error compiling. That's what it means to, to implement an interface. It means that we are going to have all the methods that are defined as abstract in the interface we're going to have implementations for. If we don't have that, then it's an error. And in maybe in, in less technical, more, more lay people terms, 
uh, an interface means it can serve in the role of, it can, it can fulfill that role. So by saying that we've implemented that interface, and by implementing this on click method, this class, the activity, can play the role of an on click listener. That is, it can have the code that happens when we click the button. Just to review, super on create save uh, saved instant state, first line, and then we um, effectively what that's doing is that's calling the super classes on create method because there's stuff that happens there as well. If we override a function, then it completely overrides it. If we want to get what is in that um, um, super classes event, uh, method and add something onto it, effect effectively we're extending that method. So we're executing all the stuff that's in the super classes on create method, then we're doing this stuff as well. The set content view sets the screen to the layout that is defined in the XML file activity main. We grab a button, a pointer to the button called P by using this statement which we looked at at great length last time, where we find the view on our activity main or in our content view we find the view that has an ID of button play, BTN play. And we know that that's a button so we cast it as a button which means that we can now do button things to it. One of those button things is setting an on-click listener. So we can set the on-click listener for that button and we set it to this. We set it to the object for this activity. We do the same thing um, for the text view that contains a balance and doing the same method except casting this one as a text view because we know this is a text view. And finally we set the balance to the value of the balance variable. So we did everything up to the on click event. All right. On the on click event, what we do is first of all we bet. All right. So we deduct one from the balance right off the bat. If they win, we're going to add five to the balance or two to the balance. I could have written the, the code a variety of different ways. This is the way that seemed to make the sense for me. To deduct one, and if they win, you add two to it. If they win with the seven, you add five to it. I have defined as instance variables in this class two dice variables. Now this is a custom class that I created. Remember the Android uh, developers uh, kit has a bunch of framework classes of all the kinds of things that are going to be common to all kinds of Android apps. Things like buttons and text boxes and spinners and all that sort of thing. What you can do, however, is you can create your own components. You can create your own components in a variety of different ways. Your own components might be visual components, all right? Or they might be sort of problem domain components. In this case, the dice is sort of a problem domain component. The device is one of the, uh, or the dice is one of the components that we have in our game, all right? If we were playing this manually, there'd be a player There'd be dice that were rolled, and there would be, you know, points that were bet or wagered on it. So one of the components of this would actually be dice. So we've created a software represented representation of that. Now, we created a class for that for a couple reasons. It's possible, for example, if we were writing a suite of games, that we might want to use the dice class in a variety of different places. So if we had all the dice uh, if we had all the dice code contained exclusively within this class, then it would be tough to reuse it. But we recognize that hey, dice is something that maybe we'll use somewhere else. Maybe we will have as part of a bigger app multiple activities where people can choose what game they play. Maybe we make a game uh, or, or uh, um, a whole set of dice games, you know, high, low, Yahtzee, whatever. All right. So because of that, we've made our own component. 
Here we're creating instances of that component. So we're saying associated with this activity, there is two dice objects named D1 and D2. This says, is everyone familiar with this syntax for this declaration? This is the variable type, that is dice, or the class. This is the name of the variable, which is called an object reference variable because it points to an object on the heap. And here we're creating a dice object using the no argument constructor. We do the same thing for the second dice because there's two dice in the game. If we were doing Yahtzee, we could have five of these or we could have an array of five or whatever. Okay. Let's look at what is it, our dice object. We don't have any constructors to find. What does that mean when we don't have to find constructors? Use a default constructor. And what does a default constructor do? Yeah, pretty much it just creates the allocation, the memory allocation for it and creates the instance variables and so on, but it doesn't run any code, all right? If we don't have to create a constructor on a class, if we don't create a constructor on a class, we by default get the no argument default constructor, which doesn't really do much. We can also create a constructor that does some initialization as well. So if I wanted to do some initialization here, what I could have done is I could have put code in that constructor or create a class that, or create a constructor that accepts a number of arguments. For example, if I wanted to accommodate different number of sides on a dice, you know, for some role playing games, there's 30 side dice or whatever, all right, I could have passed an argument to the dice um, how many sides there are. But this is just assuming the standard six sided dice. I have two methods on here. I have one. I have one that says roll. And I have one that says get image name. So it's pretty simple. I probably could also have a get value method too that would simply return the value of the, uh, of the dice if I needed it elsewhere. So I could do something like this. What does a, a declaration look like in Java for a function? We have the scope of that function which is, is public, which means that other classes can call it. We have the return value of it. We have the name of the function, any arguments that exist for that function. And for each argument, we have to specify the type and the argument name. This is simply going to return the value of the, uh, of the die. So we're simply going to return value. So there could be other methods on here too, but these are sort of minimally what we want. What does a roll do? The roll randomly generates a number between one and six. Rand Next int, 6, will generate a random integer between 0 and 5. So if I say next int, if I call the next int method, I don't know why that n is appearing. I can't delete it. 
I think it's saying the name of the argument to this method is six. But the way the next int method works is it will give you an integer starting at zero, going up to one below your upper limit. Not necessarily intuitive, but that's the way it works. Now, our dice, however, don't have a value from zero to five. They have a value of one through six. So to make that zero through five be the range of one through six, we add one to the value. So then this roll method sets the value of the die. It sets it as a property of that. So this dice will have that value as long as that object exists, all right, or until it's rolled again, because the only way to set the value of the dice is to roll it, all right? And then we return the value. The get value simply returns a value, which I didn't have. I don't strictly speak, speaking need it in this case, but I put it in there because that would be sort of a good method to have. Finally, I have a method that returns the image name for the die. If you notice in my resources here, underneath drawable, I have a series of images, D1 through D6 JPEGs. If I look at these, there's D1, D2, and so on. So the file name is simply a D followed by the value of the dice, 1 through 6. And that's exactly what this method returns. So this method returns a name of the file for whatever value that dice has. Okay. So what happens? So this is our dice component. What can we do to the dice? We can roll it, randomly set the value between 1 and 6. We can get the image that corresponds to the value of the dice. And we can get the value that corresponds to the value of the dice. And our main activity We set a Boolean for one. We roll each of the two dice, and we get the value for these. And we add them up. So this rolls the two dice. If we rolled a two and a three, would add them together and get a value of five. We then set the image view. All right? Here's how we set the image view. We first grab pointers to the images. All right, we have two images on our UI, on our layout. One's called dice one, one is called dice two. We're going to manipulate those image views. Namely, we're going to put in the proper image into that image view. To that, that's a, that's a picture frame. All right, a picture frame can hold any number of different images. So we've now given each of those two picture frames IDs: dice one, dice two. What we're doing here in the activity is grabbing a pointer to them. We're grabbing pointers to the two images. We're calling one of the images dice one. One of the images dice two, and we get a pointer to it the exact same way we've done in getting the button and the text field and so on. We use find view by ID. Remember that find view by ID finds any view that you're talking about. We then have to cast it as the kind of view that we know that it is so that our code can treat it like this. All right? I do the same thing. I grab a, bow, a pointer to the spinner. I grab a pointer to the results and the balance text views. So when I'm done with these lines of code, dice one and dice two are my two images. SP is my spinner. More properly to say is it's a pointer to the spinner. 
is an object reference to the spinner object that's on our view. Results is one of the text views, balance is the other. I set the B1 to false. I then look to see if the user picked zero and the total of the two dice is less than seven. All right, we rolled the two dice, we grabbed each of their values, we added them up. If they picked item zero from the spinner, that's what SP get selected item position does. It returns the index at that position. So zero, one, and two. If it's equal to zero and the total was less than seven, then we have a winner because that means that the user picked low and it was low, it was less than seven, which means that they won and we can add two to the balance. If SP get selected item position equals one, that means they pick seven and the total was seven, then they won and we add five to the balance. Finally, we look if they have uh, chosen an item with an index of two and the total is greater than seven, they've won and we add two. If they won, we display that they won, otherwise we display that they lost. We set the value of the balance again, indicating if they won, we added money to it. If they lost, we subtracted money to it. And then finally, we have this big long instruction that sets the value let me rephrase that. It sets the image that appears in the image view. Remember, dice one and dice two are image views, right? And think of an image view like a picture frame. It can contain many different pictures. Every time we roll the dice, we might get a different image to put into dice one and dice two. This is the syntax of the statement. We're setting the image resource for those image. How are we setting it? By getting the resource that has the identifier that corresponds to the image name. And we know that it's a drawable and we know that it's part of this package. A drawable, that's where the images lie, right? So that's why this is drawable. Package, well, it's part of this package. It's not part of some other package. And we know the image name comes from the dice class. What is D1 and D2? D1 and D2 are the dice objects. If you remember when we looked at that dice object, there is a method to get the image name. That will give us this D1 through D6. What we're doing here then is we're actually getting the Android identifier for that resource because that's what, oops, that's what the set image resource needs. It doesn't need the image name, it needs the the uh, identifier for that resource. So we use the image name to get the identifier and then we set the identifier for that image view, dice one and dice two, to the image. So that plays the game, all right? And we're all set. Questions on any of this? Yeah, on the dice.java, did you use Android to create that yes. file, and how did you do that? Okay, so if I needed to make a new class, I would yeah. go in here, file, new, and I would pick Java class. Now I have a file called class, uh, test in there. That's part of this package. Other questions?
Yeah. Well, it could be uh, it, it could be any sort of binary file. It could be like an audio clip that you want to play, or, or anything like that. So it might not be. Keep in mind, this is one of those phantom things. This doesn't actually exist in the file. Yeah, I know that. Okay, that that well, good. That had me thrown for a second when I saw it. Uh, but yeah, it could be any resource. I could have an audio clip, for example. Right. In, in other words, how am I getting the identifier? I'm getting it by the identifier's name. Or, or I'm sorry, by the, not the identifier's name, by the resource's name. So I have the resource's name here. Yeah. And I'm exp explaining that this resource is a drawable. All right. And it's part of... This package. The name itself isn't unique to be a duplicate name in another area or something. That's why you need to specify the rest of it. Correct. Yeah, correct. Uh, I could have another D1 in a different application, for example. Or I could have an audio file that was D1 or something like that. Right. So you have to, you have to qualify D1 that's a drawable in this application. Effectively is what that says. Other questions about this? Excuse me. Um, okay, we'll leave this one then. And we will look at another example. We'll look at their tip calculator. By their, I mean Deedle's tip calculator. Not to be confused with the simplified tip calculator I did. I'm going to look at the behavior of it first to see what it does. And then we will look at the files that are involved and then we'll dig into it. So we'll probably do like about the same thing we've done for all of them so far. One thing I had to do for this when I downloaded it from their website, so I had to go in and change the build Gradle to 2.3.1. All right, at any rate, let's run it. Okay, every once in a while you get this that says that there's a previously installed version, essentially is what that says. Typically, if you say okay, it will do its thing. And there's a tip calculator. The previously installed version was just something I had done earlier today when I was playing with it. And it recognized that it was out there on that virtual device, so it complained when I did that. All right, we should notice a couple things right off the bat with this. Number one, we're already in keyboard mode. Our focus is on the enter amount field. And we can enter that in. There's a slidey that indicates the amount of the tip. And there are two fields, one for the tip amount, one for the total. Couple things, here are some of the new things that we're going to encounter here. We have a different layout. If you notice, the first few examples we had, everything was linear. If you notice, there was one thing per row, and then there was the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. We use a linear layout for that, which is like the most simple layout that you can come up with, I would suppose. This one doesn't have that. Notice that we have some things that are side by side. We have this label for tip next to a text box. Next to the slider, and as we move the slider, that value changes. So we can 
instead of like we had in my simple tip calculator where you could specify poor, good, or exceptional, we can actually gear the percent, and it defaults it to, to 15%. The other thing to notice is as I type in values here, it automatically does the calculation for me. So if I spend $150 on a meal and the service was excellent, so I gave a 23% tip, the total tip would be $34.50 and the total of the entire bill would be $184.50. As I go and slide that, automatically do those two things change. All right. Likewise, were I to change this, wait a minute, did I say it was $150? I meant it was $14. Okay, then it's a $1.30 tip. If I gave a 9% tip, it's a $2.17 tip if I do that. So let's think, based on what we've seen before, what's probably going to be the same and what's probably going to be different. There's probably going to be a XML for the layout. All right? Safe bet. It's going to be an activity for the activity. When we initiate the activity, we're going to do probably the same thing. We're going to set the main, um, we're going to set the, um, the, the, the content view of it and call the super classes constructor. There is some sort of calculation in here that we're going to need to point to our controls and get their values and then do some math and set the values of the result. All right. However, there's no button here. There's no button where we choose something and click it and that initiates it. But our code is listening for certain actions. So there will be listeners, but they won't be button click listeners. All right, They won't be based on the click of the button. They will be based on changing the value of the slider or changing the value of this. So the idea is going to be the same, that we're going to have listeners that listen for certain actions. And based on those actions, we're going to go and do something. All right? And then what we do, well, is the same basic thing that we did before. We're going to grab some values from the different views on the, on the screen. We're going to do some math, and we're going to output the results. The other thing, like I mentioned, initially, the layout looks different because the layout has some things that are side by side. So let's go and look at this. And we'll preview this. Let's look at the resources. We have a layout. We have our icons, our launcher icons. And we have our values. Let's look at these things. Our activity main layout. Notice we have a grid layout. You just, you just look at the application and see what makes sense for, for the application. I mean, that, that's, the way, that's the way I would do it. The, the, the table is useful because a lot of forms that you have would be sort of like columns, right? So a grid layout is, is typically a very popular thing to lay things out on. So, yeah, grids are pretty good. You know, I mean, even getting to web pages. You know, grid layouts are, are where it's at, you know, a lot of times. Um, but I wouldn't say that in general because, again, you, you have to look at the particular application that you're looking at. Notice how this works. In our grid layout, and I said table, but I meant grid, we have two columns. All right? We have these other attributes. The height and the width is going to match the parent. 
which means that the whole grid is the whole size of the screen. All right. Our margin, our padding rather, I'm sorry, not margin, is 16 dp in all four directions. So 16 dp in all four directions. And two columns. What that means is, as we're putting this on, we're going, it's going to assume that, how do I want to put this? Well, we'll let us take a look. Edit text has a column span of two. So it knows that the edit text field for the dollar amount takes up two columns. So it spreads it across the entire width of the grid. Whereas the text view for This is, this text view overlays on top of the amount. Notice how if there's no amount in there, it says enter amount. That's what that text view is. And that also takes up two columns. Each of these things, though, doesn't take up two columns. Only takes up one column. So there's no call span. So the assumption is it takes up one column. And the assumption is, since the whole grid is two columns wide, that this will be the first column in the row. This will be the next column in the row. Likewise with text view. And that way, all the way down. You notice some of these use the color attributes. For example, the text view says at color amount background. If we look in the color XML, that is defined. Amount background is defined as that. Again, this helps us to guarantee, to guarantee a level of consistency. Likewise, the result background has a certain color, and we set both of those fields to that background. If we look in the XML. Result background. Okay. So it's a different layout. This text view, or the enter text field, by the way, we've indicated that the value is um, uh, digits. The input type is number. Um. I don't know. I don't know why that would be needed, why it would not be enough to say number. Um, let's Google it. Uh, the only thing I can key, think of is it might not allow me to, well, let's take it out. That's probably the best way to say it, rather than Googling it. Here's what it looks like now. I can put in three. Can I put in a minus sign? No. Can I put in a comma? No. So my guess would be is that that's saying, hey, you can only put in those numbers. I can't even type in a decimal point. It just automatically, the decimal point automatically appears as I'm typing in the number. But I can't put a negative or whatever. Let's see what happens if I get rid of the digits.
That's a great way, by the way, in any language as you're learning it. Is if you look at something like, what happens if I do this? All right? It's good to have a backup of your program before you start doing that. Or at the very least, make sure that you can undo it. So in this case, if we're going to uh, add it, I'll bet it would let us put any kind of number, even a negative number in there. So we can now go. Okay, I don't know. Seems to be behaving the same way. Um, let's now let's Google. I'm looking up its text view. gets all of the XML attributes from text view. So all of the XML attributes available for edit text come from text view. And specifies that the text view has a numeric input method and that these specific characters are the ones it will accept. I honestly, from that, can't tell the difference between setting that the value's a number and setting the digits to be that. Maybe they're redundant. The other thing I'm thinking of is what if it wasn't a number, but I wanted to limit the characters that could go in anyhow. Like, for example, it was like a, a pseudo number, like a phone number, where you might want to put dashes in it. Maybe. I don't know. That, but that's, that's a great question. But that's how you look it up. Again, the best thing to do is to go, like, to these documentation in there. And for the views... There's a section typically on the XML attributes that uh, exist for it. And in this case, um, all these XML attributes for edit text come from the text view. All right. I know I start a little bit late today, so I'll go a little bit longer. Let's see what else we have. We have dimensions. And we have two different dimension files um, based on... Um, the size of it depends on, the size of a few things depend on values in the dimensions XML file. For example, padding right actually is in the dimensions file for activity horizontal margin. I actually can't stand, for teaching, I can't stand this feature, all right? The fact that it puts 16 dp there. It's not 16 dp in the file. It is at demand activity or horizontal margin, which you get from the dimension file. And if we had a bigger screen, it would be a bigger margin because they've overridden that for if uh, the width was greater than 820 dp.
Here's our strings. Styles, I'm not sure, comes into play. Oh, it does, I think. Because we define the colors in there. And we set a theme for this that uses the colors from the color file. Okay. New control that we haven't seen before is a seek bar. Curious what Android indeterminate means. Oh, they show the difference between the two. See, progress and activity. Uh, uh, you don't know how long an operator, okay. The same seek bar and progress bar are used when you're like loading something and you think you know how long it's gonna be. So if you know how long it's going to be, you can specify, and then the seek bar will, will take that amount of time to move. In this case, we're manually setting the seek bar. So we are uh, set indeterminate to false. It gives us the initial value is 15. The maximum value is 30. I guess you can't be much more of a big spender than that. You can't tip more than 30% for this. Let's look at the code itself. Code itself has an activity, has a number of different instance variables that are going to be used to point to the different things on the page, on the screen. We set the values for, um, call the superclasses on create, set the content view, grab pointers to all these things, set some texts. And we got pointers to the edit field and pointers to the seek bar. These are put at the end here because these are the two things that we're adding listeners to. Because those are the things which cause the calculation will occur. We type into the text field or if we slide the seat bar. Notice that they're not click listeners, right? Because it's not clicking that we're doing. We're changing the text or we're changing the seat bar. So it's different kinds of listeners. That's why it's important to cast these variables as what they actually are. Because we can't add a seek bar change listener to a text box. Only seek bars can have that assigned to it. So therefore the compiler has to know that we have, we're gonna treat that view like a seek bar because we know it's a seek bar. Now where do these listeners come from? They're actually defined here. This is an internal class. Right in the middle, right smack dab in the middle of the class declaration for our activity, we define a new class. It's a private class. It's called, well, it's not really called anything. This is also known, and you can do this a couple different ways, it's an anonymous class. Because there's no real class name to it. We are saying that final 
on seek bar listener, seek bar listener equals new seek bar change listener, and then we define the entire class inside of this. Seek bar change listener is what? It's an interface. So for us to define a seek bar listener object, we have to supply all the methods that exist on a seek bar change on a seek bar change listener. And that is the progress change method, the start tracking, and the stop tracking. In this case, the only thing we're interested in is what happens when the progress changes. In other words, what happens when we slide the progress bar, the seek bar rather. Interesting thing about this is we're, we're really creating a new class here, but we're not giving the class a name. We're saying that it's a new uh, on seek bar listener and we're not really giving it a name. Our pointer to that variable, our object for that, is seek bar listener. And we've put all the code in here that we need to to satisfy that interface. What are the methods it needs? It needs these three methods. And sure enough, we have it. We do the exact same thing with the on text change listener, which has three methods also, on text changed, before text changed, and after text changed. So we actually when you press a key, actually three events happen. Before text change, text change, then after text changed. And we could write code in some cases, it might be important for us to write code at all three of those places. Before text change is before the, the, the key that we actually pressed gets put into that control. After is after it's been done. And then on text change is when the value of the text actually changed. It's created the exact same way. Notice in both cases, both our listeners do sort of the same thing. All right? They do some stuff related to the edit text field or the seek bar, but in both cases, when they are done, they call calculate. Because either case, if you change the amount or if you change a percentage, you need to recalculate. And the recalculating is what does the actual work of calculating the tip. It grabs a value from the uh, grabs a value from the edit text field, grabs a value from the seek bar for the percent, does the calculation, and displays it. All right, the main difference from this between the previous examples was number one, the layout is different. So we did like the simplest layout possible on the first couple of examples with just the linear layout. What's also different with this is, in this case, we have two things that the user can interact with. So we have two separate listeners. And those listeners are defined in a different way. We're not implementing the interface on the activity itself. We are implementing 
these anonymous classes as the listeners. And there's different listeners for the seek bar and app. Next time we'll review the use of the listeners again and look at more detail at the code in this one. Questions on this? Again, you can download these to play with them. A good way to learn this is to just take it and play with it. What if I do this? What if I do that? And we'll continue to look at this next time. All right. That's all I have for today. We'll see you over in lab.